Hello, and welcome to the Gradulting workshop series. Um, at today's workshop, we will be talking about preparing to buy your first home. Uh, my name is Debbie McCutsky, and I'm the coordinate, coordinator of services and programs for graduate student legal aid, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, the Gradulting workshop series is just one of several services offered by Graduate Student Legal Aid. Um, we offer legal consultations for general issues, like let's say a student is having trouble with his or her landlord, um, a student has gotten into an auto accident, or needs a contract reviewed. Um, our staff attorney, Zach Mundy, will help with all of those types of issues. Um, we also have a specialty attorney um, who handles immigration issues. So for international students who have questions about immigration and perhaps what to do after graduation, um, you can request an appointment for, for, uh, for that. Um, we have two student advocates on staff who help students who've been charged by the university with a violation of the Code of Conduct or the Code of Academic Integrity. Uh, and I'm a notary, so I can help notarize your documents, whether they're related to academics or personal issues. Um, finally, all of our services are free. Um, you've already paid for them because you have paid your graduate student fee. So if you'd like more information about what we do, visit our website, um, send us an email, give us a call. Um, we're here to help. So before I introduce today's speaker, um, I have a few announcements. Um, automatic closed captioning has been enabled for those who want to read along, so you can turn that on. Um, we welcome your questions and comments, so post them in the chat and direct them to everyone. Uh, I will be sharing them with the speaker, and if something's not quite clear, we may call on you to clarify your question. But near the end of the workshop, we will post a link to a survey. We only ask four questions. So please just take a minute to give us some feedback. How did we do today? And um, finally, we will email links to the survey, the slides, and the recording um, by tomorrow afternoon. Um, probably happen tomorrow morning or maybe even this afternoon, but we will follow up with all of this good information we're sharing today. So. Let's get started with the topic of the day, first time home buying. And I am so pleased to introduce our speaker. She's new to the Gradulting workshop series. Her name is Melanie Gamble. She is the principal broker for 212 Degrees Realty, and she's the president of the Prince George's County Association of Realtors. Welcome, Ms. Gamble. Um, Please share your presentation with us and help us get started in preparing to buy our first home. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie, and for the entire department here. I really appreciate the opportunity to come before you today. And um, as much as I love speaking, speaking to boxes with names, this is, it's always interesting in this, um, virtual environment you know i don't get to see smiling faces all the time but that is okay i totally understand um we are typically multitasking and doing a myriad of things and um this will be in in your rear view let me make this in presentation mode for you there you go so let's find your new home I did share with Debbie that I am certainly open to taking your questions at any time, but I will tell you, if you see that I am on a tangent, meaning that I'm rolling and like I'm rolling like a boulder down the hill, just let me roll, okay? Because <laughs> if you stop me, I probably will forget the point that I was trying to make. So, but without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And you know, whenever I speak, I like to um, give a little bit about me because I know when I'm sitting in an audience, sometimes, especially if you know I'm new or the person is new to my environment, 
I want to know, well, what qualifies them to come before me um, to present and tell me anything? So just a little bit about me, and I hope that this helps. I am a licensed real estate broker in Maryland, D.C. and Virginia. I am married to Jay Gamble. We have been married since July the 1st of 2000. I am a boy mom. I have three sons. I currently serve as the president of the Prince George's County Association of Realtors. I also sit on in the executive committee for the Maryland Realtors, and I serve at the National Association of Realtors. So I serve at all three levels in my industry, and this is my absolute chosen profession. As you can see here, um, in 1991, I was just like you, I had just finished my undergraduate degree and going into grad school. So I actually do hold a master's degree in public administration, which you do not need to sell real estate. However, we have it and it has um, allowed me to have an, a tremendous trajectory here in this industry. And, and I am just so thankful for the ability to to work in an industry that I absolutely love and to be able to serve people at all levels at all times. Um, but that just gives you a little bit about me, where I am. And like I said, in 1991, I was sitting uh, just like you and, and I was sharing with Debbie that I wish I had known or even had thought about purchasing a home at that time in my life. Uh, you know, because obviously the sooner you buy real estate, the sooner you start um, building equity. So that is always a very good thing. In the next 20 minutes, these are the things that we will discuss today. And um, if you do have questions, feel free to raise your hand. Debbie is monitoring the chat for me. So she will interject and let me know that we have a burning question. But I do want to go over with you um, agency relationships, financing, search criteria, the home search process. What does it mean to go under contract? And then finally, what does it look like going to closing? So agency relationships. In the state of Maryland, you um, can only be represented either as a buyer or a seller. There is such thing called dual agency, which the District of Columbia allows with no problem, meaning that I can work on both sides of the table and I can represent you with no problem. That does not happen in Maryland. In Maryland, there is such thing called as disclosed dual agency, meaning that if I work for Keller Williams and I'm representing you as a buyer and we go to see a house that is also uh, listed by a Keller Williams agent, you have to sign saying that you are in agreement with being represented not by the same person, but by the same brokerage, because there's still there is a perception that there may be some type of conflict. Typically, there is not, and it is fine, and there's no reason why you would not consent for the dual agency, but in the state of Maryland, it is a requirement that you know up front how you're being represented. Um, it is very important when you are looking for a home that you sign a buyer broker agreement with the person who is representing you. Therefore, there will be no uh, disagreement or there will be no confusion over who that agent is representing. Just like the person who listed the house, they are totally representing the seller that is why you don't want to go to an open house without your agent. You don't want to walk into model homes without your agent. You don't want to go looking for houses anywhere without the person who is representing you because they're the only person in the transaction that has your best interest at heart. So just always keep that in mind. Uh, the very, very first step when you are going to look for a home is to secure well, in the vernacular of the youth, you know, securing the bag, right? You, you've got to make sure you've got the money to go and purchase. You want to speak with a lender. That is your very, very first step. 
So lenders come in all shapes and sizes, just like uh, real estate agents and brokers. So I suggest just finding someone that has that would be a really good fit for you. Um, a couple of the questions that came in prior to the presentation were number one, uh, can you purchase a home if you're here with an F1 or a J1 visa? And I will tell you, while I am not a lender, but most of the lenders that I spoke with to get an answer to that question is most lenders will not loan money for those types of visas because you're not supposed to be working. So <laughs> when you go to a lender, one of the ways that you will be able to get financing from them is you have to show that you're able to pay them back, right? So if they loan you money, it's just like you're going to your friend and you say, hey, you know, can I borrow $5? And if your friend is like, well, if you don't have $5 and you don't have a job, like, how are you going to pay me back? So I don't know if I want to loan you five dollars. So it's the same with the bank, right? And you go to the bank and you're like, "Hey, I need a half a million dollars to go buy this house." And the bank's like, "Okay, well, how am I going to get my money back?" Like, "Okay, you have great credit, that's fine, but do you have a source of income?" And because with those particular visas, you're you're not supposed to have this significant amount of income. You, um, like I said, most lenders will not loan with those types of visas. However, that does not mean you cannot purchase a home in, you know, in this country, you just have to have the cash. <laughs> so <laughs> if you happen to have one of those uh, types of visas, you can purchase, you just, you know, you just gotta have the money to do so. Um, but when we were talking about financing, again, I would just encourage you to uh, find a lender. I have a whole list of lenders that I work with if you um, are interested and you need some recommendations after the fact, uh, they can walk you through the process. And then once you get approved, so once the lender says to you, okay, let me see, I'm just gonna look at one of the names. So I see Sharon is on the call with us. So they say, okay, Sharon, um, we've, we've, uh, we've looked at your documentation. So the documentation, that they typically need, they um, typically they like to see two years. Um, if you've been working, they're gonna ask for two years of your income statements. They typically look at two months of your last bank statements uh, for the last two months. And um, like I said, they, they wanna know a source of income. So they are gonna ask to see your W-2s or if you're a 1099 employee, there, I mean, not employee, but a 1099 person, then you um, often are going to have to provide bank statements as well as additional information on your business and you do whatever it is that you're doing from a 1099 perspective. Usually there's a little bit more documentation involved, but again, those are all things that you'd want to gather and have ready when you do go to speak with a lender about obtaining financing to go out and purchase your home. So Sharon has got, done that. Sharon has gathered all of her information. She's gone to the lender. The lender says, okay, Sharon, you are qualified for a home at $500,000. So Sharon's like, okay. So this is like now, like you have the golden ticket, right? You know that you can spend $500,000 on a house. So we go looking. So number three on the bullet here is search criteria. What is your search criteria? I will tell you, I always ask my clients, tell me what it is that you absolutely, your, your dream home, whatever that is. I mean, just throw it all out there. Just throw it all out there. Do you want a fireplace? Um, how many bedrooms would you like to have? How many bathrooms would you like to have? Does it need to have a yard? Um, do you want two stories, three stories? Would you prefer for everything to be on one level? Like what are the things that are absolutely most important to you? Those are the things that you want to think about when purchasing a home. I know sometimes, I, I know for me, I'll just speak for me. When I graduated from college, as, as I was just sharing with you guys, my timeline, when I was going to purchase my first home, I remember I lived in Atlanta, Georgia. And at that time, rent was like 
seven or eight hundred dollars a month, right? And then I just happened to be working for a real estate broker. And he was like, look, I can put you into a condo and it's only going to cost you five hundred dollars a month. And I'm like, oh, well, how do you do that? At that time, and this was 19, I'm dating myself. So this was like 1996. Um, in Atlanta, Georgia. At that time, FHA, FHA had something called a non-qualifying assumable loan, meaning I could assume someone else's existing loan and I did not have to go through any of the process that I was just telling you about. You didn't have to qualify. All you had to do was come to an agreement with a person that you were buying the um, property from, what did they want for you to assume their loan? And in this case, in 1996, in Atlanta, Georgia, I only had to give the um, owners $4,000. That's all they wanted. Now, I'm saying that's all. But at that time, like I said, I had just I've been out of college, what, a couple of years by that time, you know, finished grad school. And yes, I was working, but I just hadn't saved up a lot of money because if you think about it in, in 1996, having $4,000 today, that's like, you know, just having 25 or $30,000 laying around. I just didn't have that kind of money laying around, but I was able to scrape it together because I'm like, look, if I can come up with $4,000, then my monthly outlay is only going to be $500 a month because literally that was the, the mortgage that I was assuming from these people. So it's $500 a month for me to own this two bedroom, two bath condo, which was great, right? It was only $50,000 that I was getting. But anyway, so when I talk about search criteria, so I'm, I was sharing that with you guys because at that time in my life, all I cared about was I was only gonna be paying $500 a month. I really didn't care what it was. So that's why I was on this little tangent about search criteria. I didn't care. I was like, I just, if I can pay $500 a month and I can have my own place, great. And I'm going to own it. Perfect. That's all I cared about. But some of you, you know, you might be more particular than I was at that time. You might be like, oh no, I, I specifically need two bedrooms or I need three bedrooms and I need to be three levels. And I, you know, whatever it is you need, but you get that in your mind and share that with your agent. Because again, this is the person who's representing you. Their, your goals are now their goals. They are the one, they have your absolute best interest at heart. So they are going to be here with you every step of the way, making sure that what you say you want is what you get. Now, I don't want to be the one to burst your bubble. However, we are in an exceptionally exceptionally tight market right now, meaning sellers rule. Right now, <laughs> sellers rule. So things that you would in a normal market be able to ask for and get and it wouldn't be any problems. It's very, very challenging. So that's even all the more reason you need somebody who's on your side. It's going to make sure that your desires are being um, moved forward, but also someone who can educate you on if what you're looking for is realistic or not. Because I can tell you that in this DMV, and I'm sure you guys are probably well aware by now, it's not cheap to live here. Uh, like nowhere around here, it, it's not cheap at all. So it is also helpful to have someone who can guide you to tell you, um, yes, Sharon, what you're asking for, it's very realistic and we should be able to find that and we should be able to find it in this area and you, know, um, and you should be able to spend this amount of money and everything will be fine. The other things when we talk about your um, search criteria is, you know, do you need to be near public transportation? We know that there are certain parts, um, specifically in our metro area, we know that the closer in you are, the greater metro access you have. But the further out in the suburbs, so, you know, inside the Beltway versus outside the Beltway, 
we know that the further outside the beltway you go, the more challenging it may be for you to get to mass transit. So those are other considerations that you have to, um, to, you have to think about as well when you're looking at your search criteria. And let me go um, let me advance to the next slide. So this, I'm sorry. So we talked about financing and I didn't advance the slides. And um, so there are a few things that on here that we, I want to, before I go too far that we just talk about so we talked about choosing a lender. Um, the one thing that I did not go into is whether you go with a bank uh, versus a broker. So some of you may already have existing relationships with a bank, say a Wells Fargo or a Chevy Chase or Bank of America versus um, when I told you that I work with lenders, I work with a lot of people who are considered a mortgage broker, meaning they're not a bank but they do uh, finance properties. They finance people to purchase a home. So there is a difference. Sometimes if you have an existing relationship, specifically with credit unions, oftentimes you can find more favorable rates. But then the other thing is for people who have unique situations, sometimes going with a mortgage broker is better because they're able to shop around a little more for you. And they oftentimes have relationships far outside of what a bank would be limited to. So they can you know, search around for you to actually find a solution to whatever your situation may be. And we did talk about some of the other um, um, processes on this list but the other thing is your type of loan. So there are government-backed loans, which you would find with um, the FHA, when you hear people talking about FHA, VA, USDA, uh, those are loans that require little to no down payment in a lot of instances, and they are government-backed loans they usually have a lower credit score, min, you know, minimum credit score for you to qualify for. And typically you don't have to put, like I said, as much money down. Then you have um, what they call conventional loans, which you find under Fannie and Freddie. And with those conventional loans, typically they are looking for a little uh, higher credit score and they, um, but they usually go, they have a, a larger loan limits as well. Um, credit is very important in all scenarios, but again, with um, VA and FHA, it's a little bit more lax than it is with um, conventional loans. And the down payment is different too regard, regarding if it's conventional or not. And so we did talk about this a little bit in, in finding your right home. You know, the location, the price, the square footage, bedrooms, bathroom styles, feature. The one thing I didn't mention was schools. You know, so that's something to think about. Um, one of the questions I think someone had posed was, if I'm only looking to own a home for one to three years, what are some of the things that I may want to consider? Good school systems are always a, um, a consideration, but you have to dig a little deeper. You know, I just sat on a task force looking at, a school, at the school board here in Prince George's County. And um, I will say that there are certain um, school districts that have a bad reputation for no good reason, right? Um, you have to dig really deep when you're looking at schools specifically, um, re you know, regarding, just regarding certain areas, there are, um, schools are always a hot topic, as you can imagine. And I would just say that you really, really do have to do your own research. You cannot go off of hearsay because there are rumors that have been floating around for years and years and years all over the DMV, depending on, you know, the school and an incident that may have happened 50 years ago that has no relevance today. 
So I would just um, strongly caution that you do your own research on schools and make the very best decision. Um, search tools. So the one thing that your agent would have at their disposal is the MLS. And the MLS is basically our contract, though us in the real estate profession, um, I say it's our contract with one another. It's where we go to put the listings, the homes that people have for sale. It's, it's our repository where we put those in there. And what you see is that they're typically, they're broadcast once those listings are in the MLS, they, that's how they get to all of these other websites. That's how they get to your Redfins and your Zillows and your Realtor.com. It is through the agents who are actually putting those homes for sale inside of the MLS. And so your agent would have access to the MLS and they also have the ability to allow you to have access to searching similarly to the way that they would um, they can put your information into their portal and their portal will allow you to go in. It'll allow you to communicate with your agent. You'll be able to, like I said, sort of um, set up search criteria and it will also allow you to see things just as soon as they come on the market. And it is actually the most reliable way to see exactly what is available for sale as opposed to some of the third party sites that sometimes they are delayed or sometimes that they don't um, receive all of the uh, data because some brokers have opted out of the syndication of their listings, meaning that if I am a broker and I decide, you know, I have a hundred listings, but I decide that I don't want my listings syndicated, that means that, you know, your Redfins and your Zillows and all of those sites, they wouldn't be able to pick up my listings. It would only be people who are licensed realtors that would be able to pick up those listings and be able to share with you what's for sale. So it's very important um, to, you know, to look at that. But then also there are other ways for you to search. Uh, you can search on the websites as I talk. Also, yard signs as you're walking around, you may see um, where people have put a sign in their yard saying for sale by owner. And again, I would just caution you all of these other ways, I would still engage a professional to be with you and to go with you every step of the way, because this is not what you do for a living, right? If you are not a realtor, it is not what you do for a living. Whereas someone who has gone through the um, arduous task of sitting through the, the course, sitting for their licensing exam, and they actually pass and they have their license, they are out in the business to assist you um, and anyone else. So I would just strongly encourage you to, um, to utilize them. After you have gone out, you've gotten, you've got your money in your hand, you've gone out, you found the house that you want, then you come to making an offer. And what does that look like? So Sharon's found this house, she's approved up to $500,000, but she's only wants to spend 450, right? Because at 450, her payment is exactly where she wants it to be. So she finds a house that's listed for 450, right? So she sits down with her agent. Her agent does a market analysis for her, which is something that I absolutely recommend you all ask for, is you ask for a market analysis. You ask to, for the person to say, okay, I see that the house is listed for 450, but is that realistic? Like, did they price it too low because they wanna get into this bidding war? Or did they price it too high because um, everybody's telling them it's a seller's market and they want to see what they can get? So you, you want your agent to do a market analysis for you to make sure that what you're offering actually makes sense, right? So they will assist you in putting the um, offer together, making sure that it is the right pricing and then they will present the offer on your behalf. Once they present the offer on your behalf, let's just say they looked at Sharon's offer 
And they were like, okay, she's offering 450. She's not asking me for any closing help. She wants to close in 30 days. This is everything I want. We're going to take it. We're going to take her offer. So once that happens, now Sharon is going to go under contract. Now Sharon has what we call a ratified contract where she's already signed, the seller signed, and they get it back to her. After you um, go under contract, then that's when you start the additional process of doing a home inspection. And all of these are things that you would have consulted with and you those should be in your offer. Now, Again, we're in a market where people are waiving home inspections, people are waiving appraisal contingencies. I'm not saying that you can't do it. It's not something that I necessarily advise, but hey, it's a tight market. People just want the house and they're like, hey, I'll, I'll take care of it. Okay, you can certainly, that is certainly something that you could do, but I would just encourage you to, if you can, make sure you get a home inspection, if you're, if you're obtaining a loan, you are going to have to have an appraisal that comes from the bank. You're gonna to have to pay for it and the lender will order it and somebody will come out and appraise the house to make sure that that $450,000 that they've agreed to loan to Sharon for the house, that the house is actually worth $450,000. So um, that is very important. And so the first thing up here says maintain and monitor dates and deadlines. Because when you do your offer, you're going to put that you're going to do a home inspection within normal is like seven days, right? So you're going to do your home inspection within seven days. Um, hopefully the appraiser is going to get out there within 21 days. Uh, you're going to do any other inspections that you want you need to communicate, make sure that those are all lined up. If for some reason uh, the house needs work or, or you have this vision and you want to uh, put your own interior design touches on it and you're like, oh, I need to go in there before I go to closing. Well, again, that's something that you would have to coordinate with your agent who would then have to coordinate with the listing agent to make sure you can get access to the property to get in to see the house again and to make any changes. Of course, you're not gonna do that before closing, but you can certainly meet and get estimates. Um, I often have clients who want, let's just say blinds, right? And they don't wanna wait until they go to closing. They wanna go ahead and get the, get the windows measured and get the blinds ordered because it's gonna take two to three, four weeks for the blinds to come in anyway. So it gives them time so once they go to closing, it gives them time to get their blinds in and the people can come. And that's just an example of uh, some of the things that, that I'm talking about. And it's very important that not only are you in communication with your agent, but also your lender. Because at this point, your lender really takes over and becomes very, very important and crucial throughout the remainder of the process. You need the lender in the very beginning and you need the lender at the end. In the middle is where the agent handles everything for you. But the lender starts us off and the lender gets us across the finish line. And um, lastly, after we've done all of that, Sharon had the home inspection, everything was fine. The appraiser came out and they said, oh, the house is worth 460. So Sharon's happy about that. Everything is fine. She gets her final clear to close. Everything is perfect. And we go to closing within 30 to 45 days or whatever it is that, that Sharon said that she wanted to do. These are the things that are important. So when you get to closing day, you do need to bring your identification. You definitely um have to be at closing if for whatever reason you cannot be at closing then you have to get that set up prior to you have to let the title company know that you're not going to be able to be at closing and nine times out of ten you're going to have to get a power of attorney if you have to get a power of attorney your lender has to approve your power of attorney so you got to keep that in mind you can't wait till like the day of 
because that'll totally mess everything up. You have to get that power of attorney done and it has to be approved by the lender before you can um, not show up to closing on your house. Um, and then for the funds that you need to close, most uh, title companies are not accepting certified checks anymore. So you want to check with them on their policy as well. Most of them want you to bring a wire to go to closing. So you want to check on that policy as well. And that brings us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the end of this particular portion that I've written and planned. So if there are any questions and, or comments, I am open to addressing them at this time. All right, I'm, I'll get us started with a question. Okay. So, um, could you elaborate about the type of inspections that a buyer might want to consider? Sure, absolutely. So, depending on the age of the home, you, um, you'd want to get, of course, a home inspection, right? But then there's also, um, depending on the age, you may want to test the house for lead if it was built prior to 1978. Um, most loans are going to require that you get an inspection for termites or wood destroying insects. That is an inspection. Um, and most of the inspection companies will offer that as well. When they're out doing your home inspection, they will ask you, do you want me to go ahead and do a termite as well? So that um, you also may want to consider getting uh, inspection for radon. Uh, if your house is on well and septic, you would want maybe want to get your well water tested uh, to see if there, you know, there any high levels of iron is something that we find a lot in this region. Uh, so you'd want to get that tested. Um, also, if it's on septic, you know, you may want to find out the last time they had the tank pumped out. So there are um, there are several inspections, and there are other environmental inspections as well. Um, if you have children or yourself a lot we find a lot of people that may suffer from from asthma we ask them to you might want to get a mold test now of course you have to understand that there's mold everywhere so <laughs> but you know it's just are there levels that you can tolerate so right yep right thank you sure so someone has a posted a question about inspections um how much does a basic home inspection cost so it depends on the square footage of the home, um, but I would say, uh, just to say if you had a 1200 square foot Rambler, your home inspection may be $300. Um, if you had a 10,000 square foot Colonial, sits on two acres, your home inspection may be about $900. So it just depends. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Tabitha asks, how far in advance before seriously looking should you go through the loan approval process? Or what is the usual turnaround time for securing a loan? Oh, that's an excellent question. So if you are considering, I would say, let's just say you, you said, you know, in the next six months or year, I, I want to purchase a home you definitely want to reach out to a lender because a lot of times there are things that may be on our credit that we're not aware of or things may not might not be as bad as you think I, and i'll just say I, i've had i had an instance where i was working with someone who came to me and said you know i just need to find somewhere to rent and I'm like, okay, fine. But the amount that they were going to spend in rent, I mean, they were they were like, you know, I can pay up to $5,000 a month. And I'm thinking $5,000 a month in rent? Like, that's a lot, you know, to rent somewhere. And I said, well, why, why are you not considering buying? And they said, well, I just don't think I can. You know, I think my credit is too bad or whatever. And I said, well, you know what? Let's just talk to a lender come to find out they only had to pay like two things. They had two things that were impacting their credit. They were old. They just had to take care of those things and get the people, they wrote a letter, get the people to remove it from their credit, which it can happen. Like once you pay 
these are all things you have to talk through with the lender and you have to talk to the creditor, but I'm just telling you things that can be done. So these are all things that can be done. But long story short, they were able to go and buy a house and they were thinking this whole time that they couldn't. So you just never know. So I would just say, is if you think that you're gonna buy a house within a year, talk to a lender. Okay, sounds like good advice. All yeah. right, another question from Tabitha. Uh, do closing costs increase with the price of the home or loan, or are they usually a fixed price? And if so, around how much? Um, another excellent question. And they do increase with the price of the home because all of it is a percentage based off of the sales price. All right. Uh, all right, Rihanna says, thanks for the great info. Are there advantages and disadvantages to getting an FHA loan versus a conventional loan? Um, the only disadvantage with an FHA loan is that you have private mortgage insurance that you have to pay for and it stays with you for the life of the loan. Whereas with a conventional loan, you oftentimes you can either pay the private mortgage insurance you can pay it all up front and you don't have to worry about it on a monthly basis or depending on if you're putting enough money down you won't have to have mortgage insurance at all all right thank you yes okay shilpa says what is the room slash range for the negotiation for a typical house as a buyer um, how much of a lower price can we expect from the price listed? <laughs> Not in this market, <laughs> nothing. In this market, you should be asking, how much more am I gonna have to pay to get the house? I mean, we are, I'm serious. Right now in Prince George's County, we have less than a month's worth of supply of housing inventory. It's a very tight market. People are, are paying 10, 20. I've seen somebody go as much as $100,000 over the asking price. Wow. So you cannot expect in this market to pay anything less than the list price. Right. Mm -hmm. These are um, almost unprecedented times. Huh? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> yes. All right, Becky says, um, doesn't talking to a lender cause a hard inquiry? I'm assuming she's talking about on your credit credit score, credit report. She is. So here's the thing. Talking to a lender, no. Asking them to pull your credit so that they can give you a clear picture, yes. So, but you can actually talk to a lender and just say, look, I'm not gonna give you I'm not gonna give you my social because I don't want you to pull my credit but I have questions. And so, you know, they can give you some general information. Like if my credit score, like if I know my credit score is 780, what's realistic for me and, and an interest rate? Because just know that your credit score impacts your interest rate. So. All right, and, and she has a follow-up to that. Um, yep. About how many hard inquiries could one expect within the home buying process? So it will only reflect as one if you do it within 30 days. So you can talk to probably 10 different lenders within a 30 day period. It doesn't impact you. It, it only impacts you if you talk to somebody today and then you wait six months and talk to another person. Okay. Hi, Melanie, this is, this is Becky. Um, I just wanted to pipe in here. So assuming that <clears throat> you get a pre-approval uh, pre letter. Those are usually only good for up to like 45 days, right? Yes. Okay. So as long as you, do you have to close, like get the pre-approval letter and then close within those 45 days for there not to be another hard inquiry or you just have to have that pre-approval letter and they base it off of your credit at that point? So I've just, gotten mixed answer answers there on whether or not that would be one or if that would be two. And you know, honestly, Becky, it depends on the lender because <clears throat> most, most lenders, not all, 
you know, I don't like talking in absolutes because, you know, there's always an exception, right? There's always that exception to the rule. So I don't like talking in absolutes, but I will say that most lenders, right before you go to closing, they're going to pull your credit again, but they don't care about that, you know, that inquiry because they realize, they know what they did. True. Right. So <clears throat> but most lenders, and that's why I always tell my clients, like if you're trying to buy a house, don't go buy anything else before you close. Like do not go buy a house, don't go furnish it. You know, don't do a, get the keys, get the keys first. <laughs> then you can go do everything else. Yeah. Okay, good advice. Yes. <laughs> All right, here's a, a question from Bina. What kinds of tips would you recommend for shopping around for loans? I would say, I would, if I have a banking relationship, I would start with your banking relationship. Meaning if you, you know, you, you already bank with a credit union or, you know, with a national bank, I would start there and see what they're offering, you know, if you have a good relationship with them and, and see, and then I might ask around, um, if you have an agent, ask them who, who do they recommend? And usually we have three or four or 10 that we can, <laughs> we can give you. And you know, you could just call because it's really important. It's like any other relationship, right? It's like, who's a good fit for you? So like I work with a team of people because I know I'm not a good fit for everybody or should I say everybody's not a good fit for me. I think I'm I think I've been in the business long enough where I can read people and I'm real good on when people are wasting my time and I'm not good with people wasting my time. So <laughs> Okay, that's fair. Yep. yep. <laughs> All right, a question from Rihanna. Um so Mortgage, is mortgage insurance different from home insurance? Yes, that's an excellent question, and it is. So the mortgage insurance, if you remember, or you might not, I forget, you guys are, you guys are young, young kids. Um, but in 2008, you may have been 12, I don't know, um, <laughs> when the mortgage crisis was going on, uh, some of these, some of these loans did not have mortgage insurance on it. And, and bottom line is the industry went through an overhaul. And so now to protect against some of the things that have happened in the past, their mortgage insurance has always been around. So let me just, let me put that out there. Mortgage insurance has always been around. It just wasn't always to where it is now, like with FHA, where it just stays on the loan. Cause it used to be where if you had at least 20% equity in your home, you could get rid of the mortgage insurance. And that still is true, like with conventional loans, right? So like if you started out and you didn't put 20% down, but with the rate of appreciation over the past three years, a lot of people have been applying to get the mortgage insurance removed from their home. And if you purchased a house with an FHA loan prior to 2013, you can still apply to have that mortgage insurance removed. It's only for loans that were originated after, I believe it was June of 20 or July of 2013, that you no longer can just get rid of the mortgage insurance. Yes. So mortgage insurance protects the mortgage itself. Homeowner's insurance, you have to get two types of homeowner's insurance. Well, you don't have to, but you do have to get the lender insurance. That protects the lender in case anything happens to their asset, your home. The other type is for you as the borrower. And I'm saying you don't have to get it, but I strongly encourage you to get it because if anything ever happens, like let's just say you've been living in your house for 10 years and then all of a sudden an heir who their, their grandparents owned the house 10 years before you, they show up and they say, I have this deed that um, I recorded and I don't know why you're living in my house and you guys are probably laughing at me, but I'm telling you stuff like this happens when you have mortgage insurance, it protects you from things like that, from people coming back and trying to lay claim 
you know, or um, creditors. I mean, all kinds of things happen with real property, as you can imagine. And especially as it's been transferred over the years, even sometimes the land itself, you know, raw land, and it has been converted and developed, and now it has a house located on it. But you just never know what deeds or restrictions or whatever covenants may have been in existence on the land itself, and somebody may feel that they have claim to it. So having that title insurance for you as the homeowner protects you. So that was probably a long, one of my tangent long answers, but no, it, I, hope, I hope you got it. It was very clear, thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, Becky, wa Becky wants to know, is there an ideal time to buy a house? fall, winter? There used to be, Becky, before COVID, uh, before 20, before the winter of 2020, I would have told you that for a home buyer, the best time to buy a home usually like is in the winter because that's when most people are not looking. So if you're looking for a deal, usually I would say that would be the time. But guess what? All those norms have gone out the window. Like people are so looking to change you know their living in oh my god it's just crazy i've never and i know i just said i don't speak in absolutes but when i but i haven't i've not experienced anything like we've been in even and i tell people like i was selling homes in 2004 2005 2006 leading up to the crash right i wrote a book on the recession but even then, at least there were houses. So even it was crazy and it was a frenzy, but you could go buy a house. When I tell you, like, there are no houses. Like, they're literally, like, I have a client who specifically wants four full bathrooms, right? Every day I look in the system for four full bath. In all of Prince George's County, if you want four full bathrooms, there are only 32 houses to choose from. They're close to a million people in this county, and there are only 32 houses to choose from. Wow, so people are staying put for now. Yes, because, yeah. because what you're finding, Debbie, because people have so much, the homes have appreciated so much, and a lot of people are sitting on equity. Mm -hmm. So what we're finding is that people are not selling if they want to move, they just take money out of their house and go buy something else, somewhere else, and they're keeping their house. And you know, there was an article written recently about, are we becoming a nation of renters? Because more and more people are renting out their, their homes and the people that want to buy can't. So they're the ones that are turning into renters. Yeah. Hmm. All right, here's a question from Anne. Um, how can you determine how much down payment you pay? Is that a part of getting approved for a loan? Yes. And it and depends on the type of loan because right. with an FHA loan, uh, it's only three, you're only required to put down three and a half percent. With a conventional loan, it depends. It just depends on the loan product that you are going after. With a VA loan, if you're a veteran, they don't have to put any money down. And with a USDA loan, which are for homes that are located in rural areas, uh, usually they don't have to put any money down. So it really just depends. Yes, so yes, it all starts with the lender. Like I said, the lender, you need the lender in the very beginning and you need them at the end. <laughs> right. All right, it depends once again. Yep. All right, uh, let's see. What would you say, uh, this is from Ariel. What would you say to those who believe we are in a housing bubble and prices are inflated? Any signs that property values might go down in the future? So that's, a, that's, a, that's the million dollar question. Yeah, get out your crystal ball. Right. <laughs> I was going to say, that, that is the million dollar question, but our chief economist, Lawrence Yoon, for the National Association of Realtors, he has said, and he's been pretty consistent with his answer for the past year, 
that we are not in a bubble. And while prices may flatten, meaning we might not see the great appreciation that we've seen for the past two years, but no one is seeing that prices are going to drop. Yeah, I, and, and it's anyone's guess. Right. It, it really is. Time will tell. Time will tell. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't see a global pandemic, but we have one, so who knows? <laughs> All right, uh, another question from Ariel. Do closing costs count as part of the down payment? No, those are separate. Your down okay. payment is separate from your closing costs. Can okay. I ask a question piggybacking off of that? What is the typical percentage for the housing? Uh, I mean, excuse me, for the closing costs? Um, I tell my clients to be prepared to for like four to five percent okay. of the home. Okay. Um, and Becky also asked if if we can include the list of brokers um, in the follow up email. Uh, mortgage brokers. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So if you send that to to me, um, Miss Gamble, I'll put it in the email. Absolutely. Okay. And another question uh, from Varen: How many times of your annual take home pay? should um, you buy a house for? Um, I've heard you can generally go four times. Like if you make 100,000, then you can aim for a 400,000 house comfortably. That's true. That's a good, that's a good conservative number. That's another, it depends. <laughs> Right. Because it depends on, are you going to put any money down? You know, are you going to put down 10, 20, 30%? How much are you actually financing? So that's really the question. It's not, you know, how much of a home you can buy. How much are you actually looking to, to finance? Right. So, so but 4%, four, yeah, 4% four, four is, is actually, um, it's, it's a good, it's a good place to start. I mean, I said 4%, four times. Yep. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? I don't see any in the chat. And we've got two more minutes. Anything? Wow, Miss Gamble, you are good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you have answered all of the questions. <laughs> I Yay. know we've just we've just scratched the surface here, but you've done a really good IG, I, um, job of giving us kind of the big picture, um, things to start thinking about when you're preparing to buy your house. So thank you so much for your time and this presentation. You are you're a wonderful resource. So thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who's joining us live and those who are going to watch this on YouTube. Um, no matter how you got this information, please share your feedback in our survey. We need you to reply to that. And finally, um, we've got tax workshops coming up over the next couple of weeks, and I know that's another hot topic. Um, next week on the 15th, there's a workshop for international students. And the following Tuesday on the 22nd is the workshop for domestic students. So I will see you in the next week or two. Until then, have a good week and um, let us know how the legal aid staff can help you. Bye-bye. All right, thank you. <laughs>